Hey, welcome to Dan's Model Works. And it's a new project day. I haven't had a new project day for quite a while. I don't want to think about how long. But at any rate, it is new project day. The CP Express trailers are continuing to be worked on in fits and starts. But I've wanted to start this project for quite some time. And I'm calling this Pre-War Rivals. I was thinking that Rival might not have been the best title. It may be Competitor would have been better. But uh, I looked it up in the dictionary and, well, basically rival and competitor are about the same. So it's not like these things were ever fighting each other, but they were duking it out for the same contract. Now, these were both basically the entrance in the 1935 pursuit plane competition by the U.S. Army Air Corps. And the P-36 Hawk what you see here is basically what they entered into the competition. The Seversky P-35, um, this isn't exactly what they had originally intended to enter. Originally, they had, it was a two-place uh, machine. It had a rear gunner, and it had fixed landing gear. And, yeah, it wouldn't have done well in the competition. Um, it was damaged en route to the competition, so the whole thing was delayed and when they were repairing it they basically made some modifications to it um, they made it a, a single place plane e.g. one person although with a little bit of a caveat and we'll get to that to, in a bit both aircraft used the same engine the Army Air Corps insisted upon using the Pratt & Whitney R1830 Wasp which was a twin row design and both the manufacturers would have rather used the Curtis Cyclone Wright um, 1830, which would have given slightly better performance, but the Air Corps was not happy with its reliability over the years. Basically what ended up happening is, is the second competition, the Seversky design won, but then Curtis got their nose at a joint and insisted on a new competition, and the third time around, the Curtis plane won. Basically, they underbid Seversky. Theirs were about $5,000 per unit cheaper, which back then was a lot of money. And uh, so they won the main contract, but the Army Air Corps ended up buying a bunch of Seversky P-35s as well. And they were often uh, assigned to the same units so that a pilot might find themselves training on the P-36 Hawk in the morning, and in the afternoon, they'd be flying the P-35. There's actually a lot more information available on the P-36 Hawk, mostly because it went on to be developed into the P-40 Warhawk and Kitty Hawk and Tomahawk that were extensively used during the war. The P-35 was, in fact, used during the Second World War. Um, notably, it was sent to the Philippines, and there was a version of it that went to Sweden and escorted more than a few Allied bombers down to um, Swedish airfields after they strayed into their airspace. So I've got this book here, which is one of the Squadron Mini in actions. As you can see, it was number one. I don't know if these are still available. If you can get a hold of these, they're awesome. Whether it's the full-size ones about tanks, aircraft, or the mini ones, they've just got so many pictures and stories and information in them. They're just great. So when I said that the P-35 was a one-place aircraft, e.g. it just carried the pilot, I said there was a caveat to that. And if we look at this photo here or this drawing, you can see that there's a window. A window in the side of the fuselage. Now granted, this is a drawing. But I've gone through this book, and of 16 or 17 photos and drawings showing this area of the aircraft, eight or nine of them show the window here. And basically, the, the window was set into a panel that could be swapped out for a solid panel. So if necessary, the P-35 could carry a passenger. They were basically sitting on a, a seat on the floor which I think is kind of an interesting little aside to this aircraft. And that's one of the questions we're going to have to answer is whether we're going to build our example with the window 
and perhaps a seat in there. But that would be pretty cool. So, the kits that we have to build this, of course, are the Academy P36A kit and this Hobbycraft Seversky P35, both 148 scale, obviously. And you know the Academy one is probably going to be the better of the two, but I think we may be surprised at the detail of the uh, P35 kit. You know what? Let's look at that one first, just because it's a lower number. This isn't my first time looking in this box. Get the cover out of the way. We have the instructions, and they are of the fold out, take up a lot of room style. And there's nothing too complex here. You'll actually start with the cockpit and the engine up here. Not too many pieces of the wing. Moving across to here. And one thing I want to draw your attention to is this bit right here. There's a panel going into a hole in the side of the aircraft. We'll look at that again in a moment. Here is the painting guide, and there is an alternate with the Indian chief head on it. Let's meet the parts. Let's maybe move this out of the way. Yeah, it's less distracting. So we have a nicely molded propeller. The wheels are one piece. They look pretty good. Uh, the gear case on the engine looks all right. Looks like we have a wiring harness for the front of the engine. And here's the cockpit floor. I know that looks awfully wide, but these were pretty wide aircraft at the cockpit. The engine, I had some concerns about the engine. There we see our two row twin, ro twin wasp. Rosp? Wasp. And it does in fact have finning molded on, so that's nice. If we flip over and we look at the instrument panel here, that looks quite nice. Let's move on to the next sprue, which is missing some parts because I was obviously sticking them together with tape and stuff like that. So we've got a second cowling here. I don't know what the difference is between the two cowlings. And let's look at some loose parts. We have the canopy. And of course, this was an early version of the Razorback, which went on to be in the early P-47s. But that doesn't look too, too bad. We've got the lower wing, and you can see the wheels retracted backwards, although they weren't completely uh, covered over. So if it made a wheels up landing, actually... Uh, the damage was minimized. You know, in terms of detail, all the panel lines are there and they're not too deep. They're definitely not raised. So that's not too, too bad. And we have the fuselage. And look at this. We've got a hole on the side. Basically, the hole is the size of the window. So they give us a part to fill that in from the inside. Sadly, they do not give us the clear part, which would make installing a seat back there a little difficult. Why won't you stay together? There is a little bit of springiness going on here. As you can see, springy, springy, springy. So there's gonna be some clamping involved. Certainly a stubby. Here are the top of the wings, just for the sake of completeness. So I don't think there's anything too horrible here. Um, certainly, if we go back to the fuselage, you can see I'm not going to be doing much in the way of scratch building. There certainly is all the lots of fiddly bits inside here molded in, and they look quite nice. So 
I think I'm not going to be doing any scratch building in here unless I put in the passenger seat. Let's take a look at the P36 Hawk. I'm going to hold off on the decals until both kits are, are unpacked. The P36 is in a slightly bigger box. And we have the instructions. And they are in. Oh, they're going to fold out as well. Quite a bit more of a fold out. Ah. Looks like the parts count on this is a bit higher. It too has the two row radial, which means both kits feature the twin wasp. And you can see they've actually got some paint callouts for the cockpit here. You can just see the extent of the assembly instructions. Doesn't look like anything too complex here. Then on the other side, we have the, the peacetime paint scheme. And we also have the, oh no, this, these are French markings because the French did buy these. So if you wanted to, you could put this in French markings as well. For a second, I thought this may have been the temporary exercise only um, camouflage that was applied in the late 1930s. It was basically applied in water-based paint and it just like peeled off like you wouldn't believe. So let's take a look at the parts. So we have the underwing, all one piece, just like the Hobbycraft kit. And you can see that uh, Curtis took the extra step of rotating the wheels as they went in, which you could say is an extra complication compared to the aircraft that just simply folded them off to the side. But the Corsair did a similar thing. It rotated the wheels as they went into the, into the wing. I'm looking at this one, this sprue. We can see we have the instrument panel here, and then we have underneath, we have the rudder pedals, which are molded on the underside of the instrument panel versus on the floor of the Hobbycraft kit. And we have a probably a rear bulkhead there. Uh, we've got the wheels here, which are one piece. Uh, the tail feathers. Oh, this looks pretty good. I can't see anything too horrible. This one's missing a few pieces because, of course, I've popped them off. If we look at the engines, or the engine, you can see there's, there's finning on there. So, once they're all painted up, I don't know which one is going to be the better looking engine. They, they both look like they could be decent. Here's the gear case that goes on the front of the engine. And one more sprue that's missing some parts because I've already snapped them off. You can see here are some of the landing gear door parts. We've got the landing struts. They look okay. We have the glazing. This one is in a bag, which is nice when they do that. Of course, the Hobbycraft did the same thing. Theirs was in a bag too, I believe. Was it? Nope, Hobbycraft was naked, rattling around naked. So it's nice when they put it in a separate bag, but they have to mold it correctly in the first place. We have the upper wings right here. And... There's no rivets, but you really don't want rivets anyway. Not in this scale. The panel lines are not raised. They are engraved, which is nice. And look at the fuselage sides. And you can see that we do have internal detail. So compared to some of the dogs I've had to work with over the years where I've had to actually mold it all in. Or model it all, because there was nothing molded in. And how do these sides fit together? Because the Hobbycraft kit... Okay, yeah, this is better. Doesn't look like I'm going to be fighting with this one. Does it seem like these are awfully small? It does. And the Seversky one is even smaller. It's really stubby. Uh, 
if you if we were to put this next to something like the uh, the Javelin, <laughs> and Javelin's the size of an airliner compared to one of these. So these are the parts of the Academy kit. We'll look at the decals in a second. All right, so here are the P35 decals from Hobbycraft. 1992, so that's when one would assume they did the artwork. A lot of these Hobbycraft kits, um, if you can't find them used, forget it. They are gone. Um, I've heard rumors that they either sold their aircraft tooling or that they got melted down or all kinds of horrible things. I do not know for sure, so don't take any of that as gospel. So here we have the Indian head decals. Let's get a little closer so you can see what they look like. They're not horrible. I have seen some absolutely viciously terrible Hobbycraft decals. These are okay. Let's take a look at the Academy ones. And they look pretty good. And they give us two sets of the Indian head decals, which is a little odd. But, you know what? If we really dislike the Hobbycraft ones, who's to say we couldn't substitute one set of the Academy ones? Hmm? 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 That is a possibility. So I'm assuming there's two different types, mostly probably because, you know, it, it probably wasn't a standard uh, image, like a sticker. It was probably something that was painted on and some liberty was taken. So the decals look serviceable for both of them. I don't know if people like these side-by-side -side builds. Um, I like doing them whenever uh, two subjects filled kind of the same role or the same part in history. That's when I think it's kind of interesting to do this sort of thing. So I've got uh, a clothespin holding together the tails of each of these and some taper on the cowling because even the, even the P36 wants to splay out slightly, although nowhere near as bad as the P35. Keeping in mind that both of these are lacking their cowling and the cowlings are probably going to be a similar length. You can see how much shorter the P35 is from the P36. And, um, and yeah, the, uh, the P35 definitely a lot more stubby, probably made it a, little, a lot more maneuverable. Although sometimes you can get maneuverable to the point of instability. Um, I wonder how much, uh, putting a passenger back here made a difference to the center of gravity. Uh, the P35 book I have talks about, um, at least on one occasion in the Philippines, that there was a U.S. serviceman who was trapped somewhere behind Japanese lines, obviously had a radio, and a pilot of a P35 was able to put down in a field, and the... U.S. serviceman was able to run out, get into the plane, get into the little compartment, and he was able to take off and, and be saved, which is pretty cool if you think about it. But yeah, I wonder how much of a change in center of gravity that made. Although the basic plane was designed to have a second crew member back here. It's occurred to me that the first decision I need to make about this project on either plane is whether or not I'm going to have the window showing on this. And I don't foresee the seat being something that's particularly difficult to figure out. Um, you know, that I can just basically copy what the main seat is, only just make it lower down. Uh, framing inside the fuselage, that's not a problem. The most difficult thing with modeling the window is the transparency in that it would have been pretty much flush with the outside of the plane. And you can see that there's a thickness to the molding here. So um, 
if they supplied a piece of clear plastic that fit in here, of course, it would plug fit in and it would be flush. Um, the best we can hope to do is to put some clear acetate on the inside. And I think that is possible. What I'm going to have to do, though, is I'm going to have to thin down the inside wall here as much as possible before gluing that piece in. So I think I'm just going to uh, put together the floor and this rear bulkhead, which I don't think is going to come anywhere close to anything here, but I just want to confirm it before I do that. I just quickly tapped it. I just quickly tacked together the rear bulkhead and the floor. And the instructions say it should be approximately 100 degrees. And you can confirm that just by looking at the side of the fuselage there. You can see here's the guide for the rear bulkhead and it going straight along there. So <clears throat> we can look here and see that we're not gonna come anywhere close to where we're gonna to wanna to put this, this window here. So I think I can pretty much thin down all that fuselage side and be safe. Okay, there is step one of our preparations to install the window. You can hopefully see that I've thinned down an area immediately around the window opening. As a matter of fact, there's a little bit of a glossy area there. I got so thin that it actually started to crack. And if we hold it like this, you can see it's actually translucent in that area. Now, that's what I wanted. I wanted to get the surrounding plastic as thin as possible so that I can just put a piece of, well, we call it styrene, but it's probably going to be um, a piece of acetate. We want to glue that in there and, and have it almost be flush. And... Hopefully, we can get that glued in there and we can get a good solid bond so I'm not worrying about later on in the build it just going ba-ting and disappearing inside there. But you know that's probably what's going to happen. That'll be the next step is getting a piece of clear plastic in there. Awfully early in the build to be doing so, but you know what? We want to get that in there and we want to make sure it is solid. And here's our first four, five, six. I don't know, some of my I tossed rather quickly. Um, some of these are acetate, which is when you buy evergreen styrene clear plastic. That's really what it is, is acetate. Um, at least a couple pieces of actual clear styrene I tried, as well as some packaging materials. And it didn't seem to matter which one I used. Um, the glue actually did affect it, which was good, which is what I wanted, because I wanted these to actually be fused with the fuselage. <laughs> a good pun. At any rate, the problem was, is it doesn't matter which one of these I used. If I kind of turn them in the light, you can see that they all kind of go foggy, depending on how the light hits them. And unfortunately, every single one of these was super, super dead clear when I installed them. But just the little bit of bending that there was in the fuselage would cause them to go opaque in a certain angle. And uh, acetate is particularly uh, guilty of this sort of thing. Um, like you can cut it nice and smooth, and then you'll just flex it the slightest bit, and the layers will all kind of separate. So anyway, these are all the failures. What did I eventually use? Eventually, I ended up using, um, I think this was an Aquafina bottle. Um as you can see, I cut a big chunk out of it here. And the reason I went with this is because at least this was already curved. Unfortunately, this has the disadvantage of uh, none of the glues I wanted to use were going to be effective on it. What I really wanted to do was to cement it, melt it into the fuselage. Um, I ended up using some ABS um, cement which certainly works on the plastic of the fuselage, but it barely, barely reacted at all to this stuff. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm willing to bet that it really didn't um, react to it at all. However, it does have the advantage of having a lot more body than, let's say, using super glue. The problem with super glue is 
um, it could it can hold it on there, but you know the slightest bit of flex or whatever, it's going to go kapow and it's going to let go. Um, same thing as if you use a, a white glue, sometimes called a PVA. Um, sometimes you don't get a very good bond with those eyes. So while editing this, I realized that the camera shut off on me before I finished talking about the window being glued in place. So here it is glued in place. Um, hopefully it stays in place. That's my big concern. Um, any of the plastics that were actually weldable in place uh, went and frosted up when I bent them to fit. So hopefully the cement will hold this plastic in place even though it hasn't reacted to it. So cross your fingers. Before painting the interior here, I had to extend the details that were present inside our kit. You can see we've got some horizontal ribbing coming back here. And it actually ends right in the middle of where the window is. So I just simply extended this using some strip styrene. Um, I'm sure there was a lot of other stuff in that space. But we have no information whatsoever about what that space contained. My assumption is, and from what limited information I have, all it really was was just a, just a seat mounted on the floor that some poor bugger would just strap himself to. Um, I don't think there was any amenities back there, so I'm going to leave it at this. Now, before I started painting the cockpits of my planes, I decided to confirm the colors that I was going to be using. And I had in my head that the P-36 was going to be zinc chromate inside, the P-35 was going to be silver. So imagine my dismay when... My two sources here gave me conflicting information about the P-35, and let me show you. So imagine my surprise when I got to my cockpit book, and here in glorious full color, oops, if I, this is a good spot to film, I got a shadow over me here, but anyway, you can see that the cockpit of this P-35, uh, full disclosure, P-35A, is zinc chromate. Mm, looks more like the yellow variety than the green variety, but nevertheless, it's definitely not silver. Let's go back to our Squadron P-35 book. And that looks pretty silver to me, despite the fact that it's a black and white photo. But right here, it says, spacious cockpit of the P-35 was painted aluminum with black instrument panels. The only thing I can think of is that the P-35 had a silver cockpit and the P-35A had adopted zinc chromate. Seeing as zinc chromate was basically um, an Army Air Force requirement, or at least I assume it was, um, I'm thinking maybe it was something that was adopted in the later builds. Since we're building a P-35, not a P-35A, I'm going to go with silver. So before I start slathering some paint inside the fuselage here, you've got the P-36 above, P-35 below. Um, certainly the Hobbycraft offering on the P-35 doesn't seem to suffer from any lack of uh, detail. As you can see here, I've started the painting. We've got silver in our P-35, a version of zinc chromate in our P-36. I just threw most of these files on the computer and we're really, really close to 30 minutes. So I think we're going to be wrapping up this episode. Um, thanks for watching. Until next time, just keep on modeling.